Broadcasting live from the Business Radio X studios in Atlanta, Georgia, it's time for Atlanta Business Radio. Brought to you by OnPay. Built in Atlanta, OnPay is the top rated payroll and HR software anywhere. Get one month free at OnPay.com. Now, here's your host. Lee Cantor here, another episode of Atlanta Business Radio, and this is going to be a good one. But before we get started, it's important to recognize our sponsor, OnPay. Without them, we could not be sharing these stories. Today on Atlanta Business Radio, we have an old friend, Dave Beck, with Foundry 45. Welcome, Dave. Hey, thanks for having me here, Lee. Uh, It's been a while. I don't know if you remember, uh, you first came to visit us in that tiny office in Grant Park, something... Gosh, I don't know, four or five years, six years ago, maybe. Yeah, it was a, it was a while ago. It was cozy. It was. We've grown about ten uh, x <laughs> since that time, so we'd have a pretty hard time fitting back in there. <laughs> now, the, probably the old place fits in the new place with room to spare. There you go. Um, so, what uh, update our listeners on Foundry Forty Five? Uh, what have you been up to? Well, so Foundry Forty Five, we do virtual reality training. And, and that's our 100% focus. Uh, and, and we really spend all of our time on hard skills training. You know, our, our website tagline actually says, when there's one right way to do things. And that's where we believe VR training is most effective, you know, for process or think procedural type training that has to be both consistent and accurate. And we just find that that hard skills training actually shows real value to clients, which is of course our overall goal. Um, I mean, I guess just in, in other news, we're close to celebrating our sixth anniversary, which is uh, we're, we're pretty proud of. Um, and for people who don't know us, uh, we do have some pretty strong local ties. Uh, all four of the founders you have at least one of our degrees from Georgia Tech. And our offices are now actually located on the GSU campus, um, which I believe is the last place I saw you, Lee. And, yeah, we uh, do the radio for GSU ENI. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, so it's, it's been great because that, you know, our company is able to draw from both GT and GSU for employees and interns. And, you know, I, I guess you could say with that we, we play well with others there. Now, in, uh, when you're doing your work in developing or, or utilizing VR as part of the training, is typically the client, this is the first time they've kind of ventured into using VR as a tool for training, or, or have they just been using it and now they're just switching to you? Hmm, that's an interesting question. Uh, I mean, so we have a pretty good amount of experience on this. We've actually had uh, the opportunity to create over... Gosh, something over 250 uh, VR experiences. A lot of them are Fortune 500s. Some of them are local, like UPS, Delta, Weather Channel, folks like that. And there's a mix, probably, of people who have worked with someone else before working with us. Um, Interestingly, the folks that are the most familiar with it, and and sometimes that's actually UPS is a good example. They've done a lot of work in-house. And they did some work before ever uh, working with that. They, they even have a guy there that has the title, uh, something, something like head of immersive technology. And because he's so experienced, he's almost like a cheat code there for us where we get to actually bypass a lot of the questions or, or uh, pushback that you might get on, on things around what type of hardware you use or how to roll things out. So it's a mix of both. We often find people that are experienced with it uh, are really easy to work with. So now walk me through what an engagement looks like. So if they're never done using VR in their training before, how do they kind of translate what they had been doing maybe in real life into a virtual setting? So, uh, you know, typically there's kind of a process that goes from proof of concept to pilot implementation, to scaling. And different companies are you know, at different places in their journey. But for most of them, they need to initially identify you know, what's some low-hanging fruit, what's a training problem and that, that is good to be solved by virtual reality. And again, what we see is procedural training type things where there's one right answer are great ones. And you know, we usually pick one where it's, it's going to be very effective to measure it 
And then we build an experience out for them that's kind of their, their toe dip, you know, if you will. And that gives them something that they can learn through the process of, you know, getting up to speed on how to develop in the medium. They can have something to socialize around their business to get more stakeholders holders on board. And then the next step is to actually do pilot implementation where you get real learners in the experience, uh, get real feedback on it, and then you can, you know, actually see what the ROI is. And then that also leads to the last step, which is scaling throughout the enterprise. And that's, you know, it's great to do a one-off experience where, you know, a Delta or someone can can train folks here in Atlanta, but it, there's a lot more value if they can train people all around the world. And it's, that's just a different there's a different skill set, different problem set around that to make sure that everything that you develop is enterprise level and actually works, you know, the same in uh, Berlin as it does in Washington, D.C. Now, does this kind of training work best in certain industries or is it kind of industry agnostic and it's really the how to solve a certain problem is really the issue? You know, that's a good question because, some like we find it's harder to actually measure the soft skills pieces, but there's a ton of great companies out there that are actually doing it. So for us, particularly given our, uh, you know, kind of our strong Georgia tech background, we're a group of engineers and developers. That's really good at taking complex problems and realizing them in the virtual world. So we like to work in areas like, manufacturing, transportation and logistics, uh, things like that, where uh, you can actually take people out of an uh, a, you know, a busy assembly line and actually train them in a virtual space. Now, but could it work in like, say, a, a franchising situation where they were training everybody on the equipment you would use in, you know, in the food franchise? Like, is that something or is that something... Um that is best in real life or, uh, I mean, I would imagine at some point everything can be translated uh, to VR. Yeah, no, that's actually a great example. Lee. Uh, so in my opinion, the customer service piece uh, of a, you know, imagine a Chick-fil-A. I think that the customer service piece of actually training, and, and we've talked to several different groups uh, about, uh, about doing this. We actually did one project for uh, Arby's Um the customer service piece where you're trying to interact with a human, in my opinion, doesn't come across that well in virtual reality. But the process of making a chicken sandwich or learning how to change out the fryer oil or or even, uh, you know, an example that we've talked to, to multiple groups about is being able to hook up all of the point of sales equipment and make sure, you know, restaurants are more technology heavy than they've ever been. And so that the people that work in them have to be, uh, you know, a IT techs at some level too. Now as part of the training, is there gamification? Cause I can imagine that there, you can make this funner than you could in real life because there's less danger. Yeah, you can definitely gamify uh, an experience. And interestingly, just because it's in VR, people actually think of it as being more of a game. Um, one of the first places where uh, Delta rolled out the work that we were doing with them outside of Atlanta was actually up in Madison, Wisconsin at the uh, station up there. And it was really interesting for the train. The trainers from Atlanta popped up there, you know, delivered the VR experience to the local trainers who were the ones who actually did it with the trainees. And while the guys from Atlanta were just kind of hanging out in the in the break room, the lunch room, uh, just as, as some random folks that the people in, in Madison didn't know who they were, people kept coming up around them and just talking to each other saying, hey, when do we get to do that VR game? You know, when, when do we get to do that, uh, that training? And it's definitely not a game. You get a score at the end, but they love that because people were actually looking at, like, no one ever asked them to, uh, Hey, can we get more training? <laughs> you know? Right. So that's a great aspect to it. It's really very engaging. Now, when you're selling uh, your service in, is this stuff that they ask about, or is this kind of a unintended consequence of doing this kind of training? 
You know, it depends. Uh, it depends on what the, the situation is. Pretty much everyone wants something, several things oftentimes to be measured. So because what, what they want to do when you're, when you're looking at enterprise scale, you can actually take, I mean, it's a digital environment. And I guess big step back for people who aren't really familiar, but you know, VR training is done through a headset that displays a 3D world where you can train people in a simulated environment. And because it's a digital simulated environment, we can measure everything, where you look, how long it takes you to do something, you know, whether you picked up something and took it over top of something you weren't, but there's all sorts of things. And at the end, we can say, hey, this is how you did, this is how long it took. And that's great if you display it on the screen or something, but it's way more powerful if you put that back into an existing learning management system, which is kind of the, uh, the way that big companies actually track all of their training. So, yeah, I mean, everyone typically wants that. Some folks like it. Uh, the project we did for the Weather Channel actually involved uh, throwing fireballs at snow uh, as part of teaching somebody about the experience. So that's one example of really turning it, uh, or really gamifying it. Most people, uh, you know, want it to be engaging, but don't necessarily turn it into, you know, Grand Theft Auto. <laughs> now, um who is typically doing the leading when it comes to what is possible in terms of um, one of these training projects you were working on? Are you kind of pushing the envelope for the client or is the client kind of pretty creative in saying, you know what, we'd really like it to do this? It's a collaboration, uh, you know, back to saying we play well with others. We always start with you know, what's the goal in mind, right? How do, what do you actually want to accomplish? What, how, how will we define success and, and kind of work from there. And usually the uh, client partner has an idea of what they actually want to do before we get too deep into it. Sometimes we have, they, they might come to us and say, Hey, we have these five things that we're interested in. And then we can go through each one and say, here are the pluses and minuses of doing it in VR. And, you know, Lee, 100% VR is not the right solution for every uh, training uh, experience. It's just one modality. It works really well for some things and not others. So yeah, that's, so if we can look at those five things and say, well, here's the one that you, we think you would get the most benefit out of. If, if that's a good uh, application, this is what it would look like. And then we usually work from there. And it's a super collaborative process throughout the whole thing. Um, are you familiar with the term agile as it's used in kind of software development? Yeah. Yeah. So, so basically what we'll do is we'll do two week sprints and at the end of every two weeks, we have new content that we can share. And, and maybe, maybe the first two weeks, we're still kind of getting all of their uh, assets and, and their models and whatnot kind of up and going, but usually by week four or so we're sharing the actual content as we're building it with, with the partner and that way they can get in a headset. They can see exactly what they're, especially if somebody hasn't really developed much in it. Oftentimes, you know, someone might have in their mind uh, a scene from a movie like the matrix or minority report or something. And the actual experience might be a little bit different from that. So we want to make sure that people get in there and see what, what they're doing sooner rather than later, because if we're 10% off, you know, two weeks out, that's way easier to correct than eight weeks out. Now, when you're doing this kind of work um, in this virtual world, I think one of the benefits, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that once you have one of the trainings and then they have kind of offices elsewhere, this is pretty simple now to deploy all over the planet once you got one of them right, right? Yeah, I mean, the the challenge from going when you're going from kind of a pilot implementation, say, at a local facility versus if you're going to, you know, 100 places around the world is making sure that the content is managed in a way that it's kept up to date and that it plays nicely with enterprise level IT systems. So one just kind of simple example there is that there's, there's kind of two big players in the virtual reality space. Um, Oculus, which is actually owned by Facebook and HTC Vive. And they have similar competing products at different levels. The 
But Vive is way more focused on enterprise and Oculus is way more focused on consumer. So most of the you know large uh, corporations don't have any interest in playing in Facebook slash Oculus's uh, you know, privacy uh, concerns. So they will typically end up uh, actually going for the other uh, HTC Vive brand because they, they, that's, that's what will play nice with their internal systems. And then once, but once that's all agreed upon, this is where the cost savings probably comes in and is pretty dramatic, right? Is when they're sending it out to a hundred rather than having to do a hundred individual trainings, sending a human being all over the planet to do the trainings. This is where the value really becomes evident. Yeah, I definitely, Lee. Uh, I was actually at the corporate headquarters of one of the largest companies in Atlanta a month and a half ago that we work with, where they were talking about how VR training could have a material impact on their stock price, both from the standpoint of how much they can save in being more efficient in their training because they hire hundreds of thousands of people and also how they could be way more efficient on their capital expenditures by not having to have nearly as much space to do all of the training that they were doing in the past where they can recreate experiences that can live in a, you know, a six by six or eight foot by eight foot type space, as opposed to having to have huge, uh, you know, warehouse type rooms to be able to actually train new employees. Right. And especially if they're all over the globe, then they'd have to have those rooms everywhere in order yeah. to do it. And to stamp them out. That, yeah, it, it adds up quickly. So now, um, how has the Atlanta ecosystem been for the VR world? Uh, I'm not as familiar in this area as others, but I know the tech the community is pretty collaborative. How's the VR community here in town? Oh, it's amazing. Uh, we're We're super lucky that the folks that are in the space here in Atlanta, uh, we have a very good working relationship. Uh, several of the, the leaders of the different companies will get together. Uh, and and but there's a there's a great, uh, it's called an XR meetup here in Atlanta that actually gets a lot of people together uh, on a regular basis. I think the next meeting coming up is in the next week or two. Check out XR uh, meeting Atlanta. Um, and so we've been lucky that you know, Atlanta just overall is a great ecosystem because you've got all of these huge Fortune 500 company. I mean, if, if the headquarters aren't here, they probably have a very large, uh, you know, outpost, right? So there's oftentimes a decision maker here locally, and then you know underneath that you have this amazing ecosystem of Georgia Tech, Georgia State. Uh, Emory, there's some really interesting stuff uh, happening in the uh, immersive space at, at KSU. So you've got all of this amazing talent. And, and so it, it actually breeds uh, a lot of uh, creativity and a lot of interesting creations in kind of the immersive technology space. Now, um, since we're still in the midst of this pandemic, has COVID opened up some doors that um, may be uh, uh, accelerated getting VR training done in some organizations? Yeah, COVID has been uh, an interesting experience for us, just like everyone else. Um, I, I think on the whole, our clients are generally pretty upbeat about their training and development programs. Um, early in the pandemic, we did see, you know, I think less focus on training as companies were just kind of figuring out how they're going to operate in the immediate future that has not been wrung out everywhere. So it's, it's still a huge problem in a lot of, uh, of industries, but I guess one thing to note is that training is more important now than ever. Um, we've seen clients who have already been doing VR training. They actually are accelerating their pace. Uh, but then the companies that are just testing the waters right now, sometimes they can be a little slower to move forward just because, everyone's kind of in this holding pattern to figure out what's going to happen the balance of the year. Now, is some of the concerns with the VR that it is the it is kind of a hardware device you have to put on and sharing, and, and in order to do that kind of safety there, safely, there has to be kind of protocols and things like that in order to facilitate that? 
Yeah, it's it's interesting. I'm spending way more time talking about hygiene than uh, I ever uh, thought I would. Um, but yeah, it's definitely it's it's definitely possible to conduct VR training safely uh, in the workplace. You just have to follow a few important steps. Uh, one piece is just to rethink the training area to make sure that individual training stations are large enough for social distancing. Uh, you got to equip your stations with hygiene supplies. So you know, simple things like. Uh, you know, alcohol-free wipes or face face uh, shields or, or, or whatever make a huge difference. We encourage everybody to make hygiene training part of their training. And I think for most people it is now, um, but we, we've basically helped uh, by creating videos for, for our, our clients and, you know, that they can use to kind of show people how to, how to do it safely. Um, we've helped them with infographics, and maybe the maybe the simplest one uh, is just making sure that everybody washes their hands. You know, I mean, it, it, six months ago, if you told me I'd be discussing hand washing in an interview here with you, I probably would have said you're nuts. But it's it, it's crazy. It's super important, and it makes a big difference. So uh, everybody, wash your damn hands. <laughs> it's good good rule. <laughs> now. now um... Do you, I know you guys do VR. Do you do any AR or are you guys kind of specialists in VR, augmented reality? So we used to do pretty much anything in the immersive technology space. Uh, we actually got our start in augmented reality almost, uh, gosh, almost 10 years ago uh, when the four founders, we were all working at a different uh, company. But what we found is that VR and AR are different enough that to really be an expert in one for us and for the type of training that we do, it's better for us to focus all of our efforts on one. So we've been 100% focused on VR and training for years now. And every now and then a really interesting augmented reality thing comes up, but it, it's just not, we have, we have, uh, friends and uh, other people and back to talking about other people in the, in the industry. Uh, I mean, we have folks that we will send those opportunities to just because they're not in our wheelhouse. And if somebody wanted to learn more, have a more substantive conversation with you or somebody on your team, what's the website? So the website is www.foundry45.com. And the 45 is numbers not spelled out. Um, I'm super active on LinkedIn and I'm also pretty promiscuous as far as taking, uh, you know, connection requests. So, uh, come bring, bring it on. Uh, you can find me, uh, just look up Dave Beck foundry 45 on, uh, on LinkedIn. Uh, please, please connect there. And we have, a, there's a ton of information on our website, everything from, uh, case studies. There's a great one about the work we've been, that we've done with Delta that includes some videos that actually show uh, what the experiences look like. And we're pretty active uh, as bloggers as well. And you can sign up for our newsletter on the website. So yeah, yeah, definitely uh, love to connect uh, and meet new folks. Good stuff. Well, Dave, congratulations on all the success. Uh, you're doing amazing things and we appreciate you. Thanks, Lee. And it's really great to uh, see how well you guys are doing and to to catch up again. Good stuff. This is Lee Cantor. We will see you all next time on Atlanta Business Radio. And remember, we could not be doing this work without the support of our sponsor, OnPay. Please support them so we can continue to share these important stories. Today's episode of Atlanta Business Radio is brought to you by OnPay. Built in Atlanta, OnPay is the top-rated payroll and HR software anywhere. Get one month free at OnPay.com.